Section 8 of the Aeneid of Virgil. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book 4, Part 2. Thus while he spoke, already she began with sparkling eyes to view the guilty man. From head to foot surveyed his person o'er, nor longer these outrageous threats forbore. False as thou art, and more than false forsworn, not sprung from noble blood, nor goddess born, but hewn from hardened entrails of a rock, and rough Hyrcanian tigers gave thee suck. Why should I fawn? What have I worse to fear? Did he once look, or lent a listening ear, sighed when I sobbed, or shed one kindly tear? All symptoms of a base ungrateful mind, so foul that which is worst is hard to find. Of man's injustice why should I complain? The gods and Jove himself behold in vain triumphant treason. Yet no thunder flies, nor Juno views my wrongs with equal eyes. Faithless is earth, and faithless are the skies. Justice is fled, and truth is now no more. I saved the shipwrecked exile on my shore, with needful food his hungry Trojans fed. I took the traitor to my throne and bed. Fool that I was, tis little to repeat the rest. I stored and rigged his ruined fleet. I rave, I rave, a god's command he pleads, and makes heaven accessory to his deeds. Now Lycian lots, and now the Delian god, now Hermes is employed from Jove's abode, to warn him hence, as if the peaceful state of heavenly powers were touched with human fate. But go, thy flight no longer I detain, go seek thy promised kingdom through the main. Yet if the heavens will hear my pious vow, the faithless waves, not half so false as thou, or secret sands, shall sepulchres afford to thy proud vessels and their perjured lord. Then shalt thou call on injured Dido's name. Dido shall come in a black sulphury flame, when death has once dissolved her mortal frame, shall smile to see the traitor vainly weep. Her angry ghost arising from the deep shall haunt thee waking and disturb thy sleep. At least my shade thy punishment shall know, and fame shall spread the pleasing news below. Abruptly here she stops, then turns away her loathing eyes, and shuns the sight of day. Amazed he stood, revolving in his mind what speech to frame, and what excuse to find. Her fearful maids their fainting mistress led, and softly laid her on her ivory bed. But good Aeneas, though he much desired to give that pity which her grief required, Though much he mourned and labored with his love, Resolved at length obeys the will of Jove, Reviews his forces, they with early care On moor their vessels, and for sea prepare. The fleet is soon afloat in all its pride, And well-cocked galleys in the harbor ride. Then oaks for oars they felled, or as they stood, Of its green arms despoiled the growing wood, studious of flight the beach is covered o'er with trojan bands that blacken all the shore on every side are seen descending down thick swarms of soldiers loaden from the town thus in battalia march embodied ants fearful of winter and of future wants to invade the corn and to their cells convey the plundered forage of their yellow prey the sable troops along the narrow tracks scarce bear the weighty burthen on their backs some set their shoulders to the ponderous grain some guard the spoil some lash the lagging train all ply their several tasks and equal toil sustain what pangs the tender breast of dido tore when from the tower she saw the covered shore and heard the shouts of sailors from afar mixed with the murmurs of the watery war all-powerful love, 
what changes canst thou cause in human hearts subjected to thy laws once more her haughty soul the tyrant bends to prayers and mean submissions she descends no female arts or aids she left untried nor counsels unexplored before she died look anna look the trojans crowd to see they spread their canvas and their anchors weigh the shouting crew their ships with garlands bind invoke the sea-gods and invite the wind could i have thought this threatening blow so near my tender soul had been forewarned to bear but do not you my last request to deny with yon perfidious man your interest try and bring me news if i must live or die you are his favorite you alone can find the dark recesses of his inmost mind in all his trusted secrets you have part and know the soft approaches to his heart haste then and humbly seek my haughty foe tell him i did not with the grecians go nor did my fleet against his friends employ nor swore the ruin of unhappy troy nor moved with hands profane his father's dust why should he then reject a suit so just whom does he shun and whither would he fly can he this last this only prayer deny let him at least his dangerous flight delay wait better winds and hope a calmer sea the nuptials he disclaims i urge no more let him pursue the promised latian shore a short delay is all i ask him now a pause of grief an interval from woe till my soft soul be tempered to sustain accustomed sorrows and inured to pain if you in pity grant this one request my death shall glut the hatred of his breast this mournful message pious anna bears and seconds with her own her sister's tears but all her arts are still employed in vain again she comes and is refused again his hardened heart nor prayers nor threatenings move fate and the god had stopped his ears to love as when the winds their airy quarrel try justling from every quarter of the sky this way and that the mountain oak they bend his boughs they shatter and his branches rend with leaves and falling mast they spread the ground the hollow valleys echo to the sound unmoved the royal plant their fury mocks or shaken clings more closely to the rocks far as he shoots his towering head on high so deep in earth his fixed foundations lie no less a storm the trojan hero bears thick messages and loud complaints he hears and bandied words still beating on his ears sighs groans and tears proclaim his inward pains but the firm purpose of his heart remains the wretched queen pursued by cruel fate begins at length the light of heaven to hate and loathes to live then dire portents she sees to hasten on the death her soul decrees strange to relate for when before the shrine she pours in sacrifice the purple wine the purple wine is turned to putrid blood and the white offered milk converts to mud this dire presage to her alone revealed from all and even her sister she concealed a marble temple stood within the grove sacred to death and to her murdered love that honoured chapel she had hung around with snowy fleeces and with garlands crowned oft when she visited this lonely dome strange voices issued from her husband's tomb she thought she heard him summon her away invite her to his grave and chide her stay hourly it is heard when with a boding note the solitary screech owl strains her throat and on a chimney's top or turret's height with songs obscene disturbs the silence of the night besides old prophecies augment her fears and stern aeneas in her dreams appears disdainful as by day she seems alone to wander in her sleep through ways unknown guideless and dark or in a desert plain to seek her subjects and to seek in vain like pentheus when distracted with his fear he saw two sons and double thebes appear 
or mad orestes when his mother's ghost full in his face infernal torches tossed and shook her snaky locks he shuns the sight flies o'er the stage surprised with mortal fright the furies guard the door and intercept his flight now sinking underneath a load of grief from death alone she seeks her last relief the time and means resolved within her breast she to her mournful sister thus addressed dissembling hope her cloudy front she clears and a false vigour in her eyes appears rejoice she said instructed from above my lover i shall gain or lose my love nigh rising atlas next the falling sun long tracts of ethiopian climates run there a Massilian priestess i have found honoured for age for magic arts renowned the hesperian temple was her trusted care twas she supplied the wakeful dragon's fare she poppy seeds and honey taught to steep reclaimed his rage and soothed him into sleep she watched the golden fruit her charms unbind the chains of love or fix them on the mind she stops the torrents leaves the channel dry repels the stars and backward bears the sky the yawning earth rebellows to her call pale ghosts ascend and mountain ashes fall witness ye gods and thou my better part how loath i am to try this impious art within the secret court with silent care erect a lofty pile exposed in air hang on the topmost part the trojan vest spoils arms and presents of my faithless guest next under these the bridal bed be placed where i my ruin in his arms embraced all relics of the wretch are doomed to fire for so the priestess and her charms require thus far she said and farther speech forbears a mortal paleness in her face appears yet the mistrustless anna could not find the secret funeral in these rites designed nor thought so dire a rage possessed her mind unknowing of a train concealed so well she feared no worse than when sichaeus fell therefore obeys the fatal pile they rear within the secret court exposed in air the cloven holms and pines are heaped on high and garlands on the hollow spaces lie sad cypress vervain yew compose the wreath and every baleful green denoting death the queen determined to the fatal deed the spoils and sword he left in order spread and the man's image on the nuptial bed and now the sacred altars placed around the priestess enters with her hair unbound and thrice invokes the powers below the ground night erebus and chaos she proclaims and threefold hecate with her hundred names and three dianas next she sprinkles round with feigned avernian drops the hallowed ground culls hoary simples found by phoebe's light with brazen sickles reaped at noon of night then mixes baleful juices in the bowl and cuts the forehead of a new-born foal robbing the mother's love the destined queen observes assisting at the rites obscene a leavened cake in her devoted hands she holds and next to the highest altar stands one tender foot was shod her other bare girt was her gathered gown and loose her hair thus dressed she summoned with her dying breath the heavens and planets conscious of her death and every power if any rules above who minds or who revenges injured love twas dead of night when weary bodies close their eyes in balmy sleep and soft repose the winds no longer whisper through the woods nor murmuring tides disturb the gentle floods the stars in silent order moved around and peace with downy wings was brooding on the ground the flocks and herds and party-coloured fowl which haunt the woods or swim the weedy pool stretched on the quiet earth securely lay forgetting the past labours of the day all else of nature's common gift partake unhappy dido was alone awake nor sleep nor ease the furious queen can find sleep fled her eyes as quiet fled her mind 
Despair and rage and love divide her heart. Despair and rage had some, but love the greater part. Then thus she said within her secret mind, What shall I do? What succor can I find? Become a suppliant to Hyerba's pride, And take my turn to court and be denied? Shall I with this ungrateful Trojan go, Forsake an empire and attend a foe? Himself I refuged, and his train relieved. Tis true, but am I sure to be received? Can gratitude in Trojan souls have place? Laomedon still lives in all his race. Then shall I seek alone the churlish crew, Or with my fleet their flying sails pursue? What force have I but those whom scarce before I drew reluctant from their native shore? Will they again embark at my desire, Once more sustain the seas, and quit their second tire? Rather with steel thy guilty breast invade, And take the fortune thou thyself hast made. Your pity, sister, first seduced my mind, or seconded too well what I designed. These dear-bought pleasures had I never known, had I continued free and still my own. Avoiding love I had not found despair, but shared with savage beasts the common air. Like them, a lonely life I might have led, not mourned the living, nor disturbed the dead. These thoughts she brooded in her anxious breast, on board the Trojan found more easy rest. Resolved to sail, in sleep he passed the night, And ordered all things for his early flight. To whom once more the winged god appears, His former youthful mien and shape he wears, And with this new alarm invades his ears. Sleep'st thou, O goddess-born, and canst thou drown thy needful cares So near a hostile town beset with foes? nor hear'st the western gales invite thy passage and inspire thy sails she harbors in her heart a furious hate and thou shalt find the dire effects too late fixed on revenge and obstinate to die haste swiftly hence while thou hast power to fly the sea with ships will soon be covered o'er and blazing firebrands kindle all the shore prevent her rage while night obscures the skies and sail before the purple morn arise. Who knows what hazards thy delay may bring? Woman's a various and a changeful thing. Thus Hermes in the dream, then took his flight aloft in air unseen, and mixed with night. Twice warned by the celestial messenger, the pious prince arose with hasty fear, then roused his drowsy train without delay. Haste to your banks, your crooked anchors weigh, and spread your flying sails and stand to sea a god commands he stood before my sight and urged us once again to speedy flight o sacred power what power soar thou art to thy blessed orders i resign my heart lead thou the way protect thy trojan bands and prosper the design thy will commands he said and drawing forth his flaming sword his thundering arm divides the many twisted cord an emulating zeal inspires his train. They run, they snatch, they rush into the main. With headlong haste they leave the desert shores, And brush the liquid seas with laboring oars. Aurora now had left her saffron bed, And beams of early light the heavens o'erspread. When from a tower the queen with wakeful eyes Saw day point upward from the rosy skies, She looked to seaward, but the sea was void, and scarce in ken the sailing ships descried stung with despite and furious with despair she struck her trembling breast and tore her hair and shall the ungrateful traitor go she said my land forsaken and my love betrayed shall we not arm not rush from every street to follow sink and burn his perjured fleet haste haul my galleys out pursue the foe Bring flaming brands, set sail and swiftly row. What have I said? Where am I? Fury turns my brain and my distempered bosom burns. Then, when I gave my person and my throne, This hate, this rage had been more timely shown. See now the promised faith, the vaunted name, the pious man, Who rushing through the flame preserved his gods, 
and to the Phrygian shore the burthen of his feeble father bore, I should have torn him piecemeal, strode in floods his scattered limbs, or left exposed in woods, destroyed his friends and son, and from the fire have set the reeking boy before the sire. Events are doubtful which on battles wait, yet where's the doubt to soul secure of fate? My Tyrians, at their injured queen's command, had tossed their fires amid the Trojan band, at once extinguished all the faithless name, and I myself, in vengeance of my shame, had fallen upon the pile to mend the funeral flame. Thou, son, who viewest at once the world below, thou, Juno, guardian of the nuptial vow, thou, Hecate, hearken from thy dark abodes, ye furies, fiends, and violated gods, all powers invoked with Dido's dying breath, attend her curses and avenge her death. If so the fates ordain, Jove commands the ungrateful wretch should find the Latian lands, yet let a race untamed and haughty foes his peaceful entrance with dire arms oppose. Oppressed with numbers in the unequal field, his men discouraged and himself expelled, let him for succor sue from place to place, torn from his subjects and his sons' embrace. First let him see his friends in battle slain, and their untimely fate lament in vain. And when at length the cruel war shall cease, on hard conditions may he buy his peace. Nor let him then enjoy supreme command, but fall untimely by some hostile hand, and lie unburied on the barren sand. These are my prayers, and this my dying will, and you, my Tyrians, every curse fulfill. Perpetual hate and mortal wars proclaim against the prince, the people, and the name. These grateful offerings on my grave bestow, nor league nor love the hostile nations know. Now and from hence in every future age, when rage excites your arms and strength supplies the rage, rise some avenger of our Libyan blood, with fire and sword pursue the perjured brood. Our arms, our seas, our shores opposed to theirs, and the same hate descend on all our heirs. This said, within her anxious mind she weighs the means of cutting short her odious days. Then to Sicaeus nurse she briefly said, for when she left her country hers was dead. Go, Barke, call my sister. Let her care the solemn rites of sacrifice prepare. The sheep and all the atoning offerings bring, sprinkling her body from the crystal spring with living drops. Then let her come, and thou with sacred fillets bind thy hoary brow. Thus will I pay my vows to Stygian Jove, and end the cares of my disastrous love. Then cast the Trojan image on the fire, and, as that burns, my passions shall expire. The nurse moves onward with officious care, and all the speed her aged limbs can bear. But furious Dido, with dark thoughts involved, shook at the mighty mischief she resolved. With livid spots distinguished was her face, Red were her rolling eyes, and discomposed her pace. Ghastly she gazed, with pain she drew her breath, And nature shivered at approaching death. Then swiftly to the fatal place she passed, And mounts the funeral pile with furious haste, Unsheathes the sword the Trojan left behind, Not for so dire an enterprise designed. But when she viewed the garments loosely spread, which once he wore, and saw the conscious bed, she paused, and with a sigh the robes embraced. Then on the couch her trembling body cast, repressed the ready tears, and spoke her last. Dear pledges of my love, while heaven so pleased, receive a soul of mortal anguish eased. My fatal course is finished, and I go a glorious name among the ghosts below. A lofty city by my hands is raised, Pygmalion punished, and my lord appeased. What could my fortune have afforded more, had the false Trojan never touched my shore? 
then kissed the couch and must i die she said and unrevenged tis doubly to be dead yet even this death with pleasure i receive on any terms tis better than to live these flames from far may the false trojan view these boding omens his base flight pursue she said and struck deep entered in her side the piercing steel with reeking purple dyed clogged in the wound the cruel weapon stands the spouting blood came streaming on her hands her sad attendants saw the deadly stroke and with loud cries the sounding palace shook distracted from the fatal sight they fled and through the town the dismal rumour spread first from the frighted court the yell began redoubled thence from house to house it ran the groans of men with shrieks laments and cries of mixing women mount the vaulted skies not less the clamour than if ancient tyre or the new carthage set by foes on fire the rolling ruin with their loved abodes involved the blazing temples of their gods her sister hears and furious with despair she beats her breast and rends her yellow hair and calling on eliza's name aloud runs breathless to the place and breaks the crowd was all that pomp of woe for this prepared these fires this funeral pile these altars reared was all this train of plots contrived said she all only to deceive unhappy me which is the worst didst thou in death pretend to scorn thy sister or delude thy friend thy summoned sister and thy friend had come one sword had served us both one common tomb was i to raise the pile the powers invoke not to be present at the fatal stroke at once thou hast destroyed thyself and me thy town thy senate and thy colony bring water bathe the wound while i in death lay close my lips to hers and catch the flying breath this said she mounts the pile with eager haste and in her arms the gasping queen embraced her temples chafed and her own garments tore to staunch the streaming blood and cleanse the gore thrice dido tried to raise her drooping head and fainting thrice fell grovelling on the bed thrice oped her heavy eyes and sought the light but having found it sickened at the sight and closed her lids at last in endless night then juno grieving that she should sustain a death so lingering and so full of pain sent iris down to free her from the strife of labouring nature and dissolve her life for since she died not doomed by heaven's decree or her own crime but human casualty and rage of love that plunged her in despair the sisters had not cut the topmost hair which proserpine and they can only know nor made her sacred to the shades below downward the various goddess took her flight and drew a thousand colours from the light then stood above the dying lover's head and said i thus devote thee to the dead this offering to the infernal gods i bear thus while she spoke she cut the fatal hair the struggling soul was loosed and life dissolved in air end of section eight section nine of the aeneid of virgil this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Aeneid of Virgil Translated by John Dryden Book 5, Part 1 Meantime the Trojan cuts his watery way, Fixed on his voyage through the curling sea, Then, casting back his eyes with dire amaze, sees on the punic shore the mounting blaze the cause unknown yet his presaging mind the fate of dido from the fire divined he knew the stormy souls of womankind what secret springs their eager passions move how capable of death for injured love dire auguries from hence the trojans draw till neither fires nor shining shores they saw now seas and skies their prospect only bound 
an empty space above a floating field around but soon the heavens with shadows were o'erspread a swelling cloud hung hovering o'er their head livid it looked the threatening of a storm then night and horror ocean's face deform the pilot palinurus cried aloud what gusts of weather from that gathering cloud my thoughts presage ere yet the tempest roars stand to your tackle mates and stretch your oars contract your swelling sails and luff to the wind the frighted crew performed the task assigned then to his fearless chief not heaven said he though jove himself should promise italy can stem the torrent of this raging sea mark how the shifting winds from west arise and what collected night involves the skies nor can our shaken vessels live at sea much less against the tempest force their way tis fate diverts our course and fate we must obey not far from hence if i observed aright the southing of the stars and polar light sicilia lies whose hospitable shores in safety we may reach with struggling oars aeneas then replied too sure i find we strive in vain against the seas and wind now shift your sails what place can please me more than what you promise the sicilian shore whose hallowed earth anchises bones contains and where a prince of trojan lineage reigns the course resolved before the western wind they scud amain and make the port assigned meantime acestes from a lofty stand beheld the fleet descending on the land and not unmindful of his ancient race down from the cliff he ran with eager pace and held the hero in a strict embrace of a rough libyan bear the spoils he wore and either hand a pointed javelin bore his mother was a dame of dardan blood his sire crinesus a sicilian flood he welcomes his returning friends ashore with plenteous country cates and homely store now when the following morn had chased away the flying stars and light restored the day aeneas called the trojan troops around and thus bespoke them from a rising ground offspring of heaven divine dardanian race the sun revolving through the ethereal space the shining circle of the year has filled since first this isle my father's ashes held and now the rising day renews the year a day forever sad forever dear this would i celebrate with annual games with gifts on altars piled and holy flames though banished to gaetulia's barren sands caught on the grecian seas or hostile lands but since this happy storm our fleet has driven not as i deem without the will of heaven upon these friendly shores and flowery plains which hide anchises and his blessed remains let us with joy perform his honours due and pray for prosperous winds our voyage to renew pray that in towns and temples of our own the name of great anchises may be known and yearly games may spread the gods renown our sports acestes of the trojan race with royal gifts ordained is pleased to grace two steers on every ship the king bestows his gods and ours shall share your equal vows besides if nine days hence the rosy morn shall with unclouded light the skies adorn that day with solemn sports i mean to grace light galleys on the seas shall run a watery race some shall in swiftness for the goal contend and others try the twanging bow to bend the strong with iron gauntlets armed shall stand opposed in combat on the yellow sand let all be present at the games prepared and joyful victors wait the just reward but now assist the rites with garlands crowned he said and first his brows with myrtle bound then helimus by his example led and old acestes each adorned his head thus young ascanius with a sprightly grace his temples tied and all the trojan race
Aeneas then advanced amidst the train, by thousands followed through the flowery plain, to great Anchises' tomb, which when he found, he poured to Bacchus on the hallowed ground two bowls of sparkling wine, of milk two more, and two from offered bulls of purple gore. With roses then the sepulchre he strode, and thus his father's ghost bespoke aloud. Hail, O ye holy manes, hail again, paternal ashes now reviewed in vain. The gods permitted not that you with me should reach the promised shores of Italy, or Tiber's flood, what flood soe'er it be. Scarce had he finished when, with speckled pride, a serpent from the tomb began to glide, his huge bulk on seven high volumes rolled, blue was his breadth of back, but streaked with scaly gold. Thus riding on his curls, he seemed to pass a rolling fire along and singe the grass. More various colors through his body run than Iris when her bow imbibes the sun betwixt the rising altars and around the sacred monster shot along the ground. With harmless play amidst the bowls he passed, and with his lolling tongue assayed the taste. Thus fed with holy food, the wondrous guest within the hollow tomb retired to rest. The pious prince, surprised at what he viewed, the funeral honors with more zeal renewed, doubtful if this place's genius were or guardian of his father's sepulchre. Five sheep, according to the rites, he slew, as many swine and steers of sable hue, new generous wine he from the goblets poured, and called his father's ghost from hell restored. The glad attendants in long order come, offering their gifts at great Anchises' tomb. Some add more oxen, some divide the spoil, some place the chargers on the grassy soil, some blow the fires and offered entrails broil. Now came the day desired, the skies were bright with rosy luster of the rising light, the bordering people, roused by sounding fame of Trojan feasts and great Acestes' name, the crowded shore with acclamations fill, part to behold and part to prove their skill. And first the gifts in public view they place, green laurel wreaths and palm the victor's grace. Within the circle arms and tripods lie, ingots of gold and silver heaped on high, and vests embroidered of the Tyrian dye. The trumpet's clangor then the feast proclaims, and all prepare for their appointed games. Four galleys first, which equal rowers bear, advancing in the watery lists appear, the speedy dolphin that outstrips the wind, bore Menestheus, author of the Memian kind. Gaius the vast Chimera's bulk commands, which rising like a towering city stands. Three Trojans tug at every laboring oar, three banks in three degrees the sailors bore. Beneath their sturdy strokes the billows roar. Sergestus, who began the Sergian race, in the great centaur took the leading place. Cloanthus on the sea-green Scylla stood, from whom Cluentius draws his Trojan blood. Far in the sea, against the foaming shore, there stands a rock, the raging billows roar above his head in storms, but when tis clear, uncurl their ridgy backs, and at his foot appear. In peace below the gentle waters run, the cormorants above lie basking in the sun. On this the hero fixed an oak in sight, the mark to guide the mariners aright, to bear with this the seamen stretch their oars, then round the rock they steer, and seek the former shores. The lots decide their place. Above the rest, each leader shining in his Tyrian vest, the common crew with wreaths of poplar boughs, their temples crown and shade their sweaty brows, besmeared with oil, their naked shoulders shine, all take their seats and wait the sounding sign. They grip their oars, and every panting breast is raised by turns with hope, by turns with fear depressed. The clangor of the trumpet gives the sign, at once they start, advancing in a line. With shouts the sailors rend the starry skies, 
lashed with their oars the smoky billows rise sparkles the briny main and the vexed ocean fries exact in time with equal strokes they row at once the brushing oars and brazen prow dash up the sandy waves and ope the depths below not fiery coursers in a chariot race invade the field with half so swift a pace not the fierce driver with more fury lends the sounding lash and ere the stroke descends low to the wheels his pliant body bends the partial crowd their hopes and fears divide and aid with eager shouts the favoured side cries murmurs clamours with a mixing sound from woods to woods from hills to hills rebound amidst the loud applauses of the shore gaius outstripped the rest and sprung before cloanthus better manned pursued him fast but his o'ermasted galley checked his haste the centaur and the dolphin brush the brine with equal oars advancing in a line and now the mighty centaur seems to lead and now the speedy dolphin gets ahead now board to board the rival vessels row the billows lave the skies and ocean groans below they reached the mark proud gaius and his train in triumph rode the victors of the main but steering round he charged his pilot stand more close to shore and skim along the sand let others bear to sea menetus heard but secret shelves too cautiously he feared and fearing sought the deep and still aloof he steered with louder cries the captain called again bear to the rocky shore and shun the main he spoke and speaking at his stern he saw the bold cloanthus near the shelvings draw betwixt the mark and him the scylla stood and in a closer compass ploughed the flood he passed the mark and wheeling got before gaius blasphemed the gods devoutly swore cried out for anger and his hair he tore mindless of others lives so high was grown his rising rage and careless of his own the trembling dotard to the deck he drew then hoisted up and overboard he threw this done he seized the helm his fellows cheered turned short upon the shelves and madly steered hardly his head the plunging pilot rears clogged with his clothes and cumbered with his years now dropping wet he climbs the cliff with pain the crowd that saw him fall and float again shout from the distant shore and loudly laughed to see his heaving breast disgorge the briny draught the following centaur and the dolphin's crew their vanished hopes of victory renew while gaius lags they kindle in the race to reach the mark sergesthus takes the place menestheus pursues and while around they wind comes up not half his galley's length behind then on the deck amidst his mates appeared and thus their drooping courage he cheered my friends and hector's followers heretofore exert your vigour tug the labouring oar stretch to your strokes my still unconquered crew whom from the flaming walls of troy i drew in this our common interest let me find that strength of hand that courage of the mind as when you stemmed the strong malayan flood and o'er the syrtes broken billows rode i seek not now the foremost palm to gain though yet but ah that haughty wish is vain let those enjoy it whom the gods ordain but to be last the lags of all the race redeem yourselves and me from that disgrace now one and all they tug amain they row at the full stretch and shake the brazen prow the sea beneath them sinks their labouring sides are swelled and sweat runs guttering down in tides chance aids their daring with unhoped success sergesthus eager with his beak to press betwixt the rival galley and the rock shuts up the unwieldy centaur in the lock the vessel struck and with a dreadful shock her oars she shivered and her head she broke the trembling rowers from their banks arise and anxious for themselves renounce the prize with iron poles they heave her off the shores 
and gather from the sea their floating oars the crew of menestheus with elated minds urge their success and call the willing winds then ply their oars and cut their liquid way in larger compass on the roomy sea as when the dove her rocky hold forsakes roused in affright her sounding wings she shakes the cavern rings with clattering out she flies and leaves her callow care and cleaves the skies at first she flutters but at length she springs to smooth her flight and shoots upon her wings so menestheus in the dolphin cuts the sea and flying with a force that force assists his way sergesthus in the centaur soon he passed wedged in the rocky shoals and sticking fast in vain the victor he with cries implores and practices to row with shattered oars then menestheus bears with gaius and outflies the ship without a pilot yields the prize unvanquished scylla now alone remains her he pursues and all his vigor strains shouts from the favoring multitude arise applauding echo to the shouts replies shouts wishes and applause run rattling through the skies these clamors with disdain the scylla heard much grudged the praise but more the robbed reward resolved to hold their own they mend their pace all obstinate to die or gain the race raised with success the dolphin swiftly ran for they can conquer who believe they can both urge their oars and fortune both supplies and both perhaps had shared an equal prize when to the seas cloanthus holds his hands and succor from the watery powers demands gods of the liquid realms on which i row if given by you the laurel bind my brow assist to make me guilty of my vow a snow-white bull shall on your shore be slain his offered entrails cast into the main and ruddy wine from golden goblets thrown your grateful gift and my return shall own the choir of nymphs and phorcus from below with virgin panopea heard his vow and old portunus with his breadth of hand pushed on and sped the galley to the land swift as a shaft or winged wind she flies and darting to the port obtains the prize the herald summons all and then proclaims cloanthus conqueror of the naval games the prince with laurel crowns the victor's head and three fat steers are to his vessel led the ship's reward with generous wine beside and sums of silver which the crew divide the leaders are distinguished from the rest the victor honored with a nobler vest where gold and purple strive an equal rose and needlework its happy cost bestows there ganymede is wrought with living art chasing through ida's groves the trembling heart breathless he seems yet eager to pursue when from aloft descends in open view the bird of jove and sousing on his prey with crooked talons bears the boy away in vain with lifted hands and gazing eyes his guards behold him soaring through the skies and dogs pursue his flight with imitated cries menestheus the second victor was declared and summoned there the second prize he shared a coat of mail brave demelios bore more brave aeneas from his shoulders tore in single combat on the trojan shore this was ordained for menestheus to possess in war for his defence for ornament and peace rich was the gift and glorious to behold but yet so ponderous with its plates of gold that scarce two servants could the weight sustain yet loaded thus demolius o'er the plain pursued and lightly seized the trojan train the third succeeding to the last reward two goodly bowls of massy silver shared with figures prominent and richly wrought and two brass cauldrons from dodona brought thus all rewarded by the heroes hands their conquering temples bound with purple bands and now sergesthus clearing from the rock brought back his galley shattered with the shock forlorn she looked without an aiding oar and houted by the vulgar made to shore 
as when a snake surprised upon the road is crushed athwart her body by the load of heavy wheels or with a mortal wound her belly bruised and trodden to the ground in vain with loosened curls she crawls along yet fierce above she brandishes her tongue glares with her eyes and bristles with her scales but grovelling in the dust her parts unsound she trails so slowly to the port the centaur tends but what she wants in oars with sails amends yet for his galley saved the grateful prince is pleased the unhappy chief to recompense foloe the cretan slave rewards his care beauteous herself with lovely twins as fair from thence his way the trojan hero bent into the neighboring plain with mountains pent whose sides were shaded with surrounding wood full in the midst of this fair valley stood a native theatre which rising slow by just degrees o'erlooked the ground below high on a sylvan throne the leader sat a numerous train attend in solemn state here those that in the rapid course delight desire of honour and the prize invite the rival runners without order stand the trojans mixed with the sicilian band first nisus with euryalus appears euryalus a boy of blooming years with sprightly grace and equal beauty crowned nisus for friendship to the youth renowned diores next of priam's royal race then salius joined with patron took their place but patron in arcadia had his birth and salius his from arcananian earth then two sicilian youths the names of these swift helimus and lovely panopes both jolly huntsmen both in forest bred and owning old acestes for their head with several others of ignobler name whom time has not delivered o'er to fame to these the hero thus his thoughts explained in words which general approbation gained one common largesse is for all designed the vanquished and the victor shall be joined two darts of polished steel and gnosian wood a silver-studded axe alike bestowed the foremost three have olive wreaths decreed the first of these obtains a stately steed adorned with trappings and the next in fame the quiver of an amazonian dame with feathered thracian arrows well supplied a golden belt shall gird his manly side which with a sparkling diamond shall be tied the third this grecian helmet shall content he said to their appointed base they went with beating hearts the expected sign receive and starting all at once the barrier leave spread out as on the winged winds they flew and seized the distant goal with greedy view shot from the crowd swift nisus all o'erpassed nor storms nor thunder equal half his haste the next but though the next yet far disjoined came salius and euryalus behind then helimus whom young diores plied step after step and almost side by side his shoulders pressing and in longer space had won or left at least a dubious race now spent the goal they almost reach at last when eager nisus hapless in his haste slipped first and slipping fell upon the plain soaked with the blood of oxen newly slain the careless victor had not marked his way but treading where the treacherous puddle lay his heels flew up and on the grassy floor he fell besmeared with filth and holy gore not mindless then euryalus of thee nor of the sacred bonds of amity he strove the immediate rival's hope to cross and caught the foot of salius as he rose so salius lay extended on the plain euryalus springs out the prize to gain and leaves the crowd applauding peals attend the victor to the goal who vanquished by his friend next helimus and then diores came by two misfortunes made the third in fame but salius enters and exclaiming loud for justice deafens and disturbs the crowd urges his cause may in the court be heard and pleads the prize is wrongfully conferred but favour for euryalus appears his blooming beauty with his tender tears had bribed the judges for the promised prize besides diores fills the court with cries who vainly reaches at the last reward 
if the first palm on Salius be conferred. Then thus the prince, let no disputes arise, where fortune placed it, I award the prize. But fortune's errors give me leave to mend, at least to pity my deserving friend. He said, and from the spoils he draws, ponderous with shaggy mane and golden paws, a lion's hide, to Salius thus he gives. Nisus with envy sees the gift and grieves. If such rewards to vanquished men are due, he said, and falling is to rise by you, what prize may Nisus from your bounty claim, who merited the first rewards and fame? In falling both an equal fortune tried, would fortune for my fall so well provide? With this he pointed to his face, and showed his hand and all his habit smeared with blood. The indulgent father of the people smiled, and caused to be produced an ample shield of wondrous art by Didymion wrought, long since from Neptune's bars in triumph brought. This given to Nisus he divides the rest, and equal justice in his gifts expressed. The race thus ended, and rewards bestowed, once more the prince bespeaks the attentive crowd. If there be here whose dauntless courage dare in gauntlet fight, with limbs and body bare his opposite sustain in open view, stand forth the champion, and the games renew. Two prizes I propose, and thus divide. A bull with gilded horns and fillets tied shall be the portion of the conquering chief. A sword and helm shall cheer the loser's grief. Then haughty Dares in the lists appears, stalking he strides, his head erected bears. His nervous arms the weighty gauntlet wield, and loud applauses echo through the field. Dares alone in combat used to stand the match of mighty Paris hand to hand. The same at Hector's funerals undertook gigantic Butes of the Amician stock, and by the stroke of his resistless hand, stretched the vast bulk upon the yellow sand such dares was and such he strode along and drew the wonder of the gazing throng his brawny back and ample breast he shows his lifted arms around his head he throws and deals in whistling air his empty blows his matches sought but through the trembling band not one dares answer to the proud demand presuming of his force with sparkling eyes Already he devours the promised prize. He claims the bull with all his insolence, and having seized his horns, accosts the prince. If none my matchless valor dares oppose, how long shall Dares wait his dastard foes? Permit me, chief, permit without delay to lead this uncontended gift away. The crowd assents, and with redoubled cries for the proud challenger demands the prize. Acestes, fired with just disdain to see the palm usurped without a victory, reproached Entellus thus who sat beside, and heard and saw unmoved the Trojan's pride. Once but in vain a champion of renown, so tamely can you bear the ravished crown, a prize in triumph borne before your sight, and shun for fear the danger of the fight? where is our eryx now the boasted name the god who taught your thundering arm the game where now your baffled honour where the spoil that filled your house and fame that filled our isle and tell is thus my soul is still the same unmoved with fear and moved with martial fame but my chill blood is curdled in my veins and scarce the shadow of a man remains Oh, could I turn to that fair prime again, that prime of which this boaster is so vain, the brave who this decrepit age defies should feel my force without the promised prize. He said, and rising at the word, he threw two ponderous gauntlets down in open view, gauntlets which Eryx wont in fight to wield, and sheathe his hands with in the listed field. With fear and wonder seized, the crowd beholds the gloves of death, with seven distinguished folds of tough bull hides. The space within is spread with iron, or with loads of heavy lead. Dares himself was daunted at the sight, renounced his challenge, and refused to fight. 
astonished at their weight the hero stands and poised the ponderous engines in his hands what had your wonder said entellus ben had you the gauntlets of alcides seen or viewed the stern debate on this unhappy green these which i bear your brother eryx bore still marked with battered brains and mingled gore with these he long sustained the herculean arm and these i wielded while my blood was warm this languished frame while better spirits fed ere age unstrung my nerves or time or snowed my head but if the challenger these arms refuse and cannot wield their weight or dare not use if great aeneas and acestes join in his request these gauntlets i resign let us with equal arms perform the fight and let him leave to fear since i resign my right end of section nine section ten of the aeneid of virgil this librivox recording is in the public domain book five part two this said entellus for the strife prepares stripped of his quilted coat his body bears composed of mighty bones and brawn he stands a goodly towering object on the sands then just aeneas equal arms supplied which round their shoulders to their wrists they tied both on the tiptoes stand at full extent their arms aloft their bodies inly bent their heads from aiming blows they bear afar with clashing gauntlets then provoke the war one on his youth and pliant limbs relies one on his sinews and his giant size the last is stiff with age his motion slow he heaves for breath he staggers to and fro and clouds of issuing smoke his nostrils loudly blow yet equal in success they ward they strike their ways are different but their art alike before behind the blows are dealt around their hollow sides the rattling thumps resound a storm of strokes well meant with fury flies and errs about their temples ears and eyes not always errs for oft the gauntlet draws a sweeping stroke along the crackling jaws heavy with age and tellus stands his ground but with his warping body wards the wound his hand and watchful eye keep even pace while dares traverses and shifts his place and like a captain who beleaguers round some strong-built castle on a rising ground views all the approaches with observing eyes this and that other part in vain he tries and more on industry than force relies with hands on high entellus threats the foe but dares watched the motion from below and slipped aside and shunned the long descending blow entellus wastes his forces on the wind and thus deluded of the stroke designed headlong and heavy fell his ample breast and weighty limbs his ancient mother pressed so falls a hollow pine that long had stood on ida's height or yerimanthus wood torn from the roots the differing nations rise and shouts and mingled murmurs rend the skies acestus runs with eager haste to raise the fallen companion of his youthful days dauntless he rose and to the fight returned with shame his glowing cheeks his eyes with fury burned disdain and conscious virtue fired his breast and with redoubled force his foe he pressed he lays on load with either hand amain and headlong drives the trojan o'er the plain nor stops nor stays nor rest nor breath allows but storms of strokes descend about his brows a rattling tempest and a hail of blows but now the prince who saw the wild increase of wounds commands the combatants to cease and bounds entellus wrath and bids the peace first to the trojan spent with toil he came and soothed his sorrow for the suffered shame what fury seized my friend the gods said he to him propitious and averse to thee have given his arm superior force to thine tis madness to contend with strength divine the gauntlet fight thus ended from the shore his faithful friends unhappy dares bore his mouth and nostrils poured a purple flood and pounded teeth came rushing with his blood faintly he staggered through the hissing throng 
and hung his head and trailed his legs along the sword and casque are carried by his train but with his foe the palm and ox remain the champion then before aeneas came proud of his prize but prouder of his fame o goddess born and you dardanian host mark with attention and forgive my boast learn what i was by what remains and know from what impending fate you save my foe sternly he spoke and then confronts the bull and on his ample forehead aiming full the deadly stroke descending pierced the skull down drops the beast nor needs a second wound but sprawls in pangs of death and spurns the ground then thus in dares stead i offer this eryx accept a nobler sacrifice take the last gift my withered arms can yield thy gauntlets i resign and here renounce the field this done aeneas orders for the close the strife of archers with contending bows the mast sergesthus shattered galley bore with his own hands he raises on the shore a fluttering dove upon the top they tie the living mark at which their arrows fly the rival archers in a line advance their turn of shooting to receive from chance a helmet holds their names the lots are drawn on the first scroll was read hippocorn the people shout upon the next was found young menestheus late with naval honours crowned the third contained eurytion's noble name thy brother pandarus and next in fame whom pallas urged the treaty to confound and send among the greeks a feathered wound acestes in the bottom last remained whom not his age from youthful sports restrained soon all the vigour bend their trusty bows soon all with vigour bend their trusty bows and from the quiver each his arrow chose hippocorns was the first with forceful sway it flew and whizzing cut the liquid way fixed in the mast the feathered weapon stands the fearful pigeon flutters in her bands and the tree trembled and the shouting cries of the pleased people rend the vaulted skies then menestheus to the head his arrow drove with lifted eyes and took his aim above but made a glancing shot and missed the dove yet missed so narrow that he cut the cord which fastened by the foot the flitting bird the captive thus released away she flies and beats with clapping wings the yielding skies his bow already bent eurytion stood and having first invoked his brother god his winged shaft with eager haste he sped the fatal message reached her as she fled she leaves her life aloft she strikes the ground and renders back the weapon in the wound acestes grudging at his lot remains without a prize to gratify his pains yet shooting upward sends his shaft to show an archer's art and boast his twanging bow the feathered arrow gave a dire portent and latter augurs judge from this event chafed by the speed it fired and as it flew a trail of following flames ascending drew kindling they mount and mark the shiny way across the skies as falling meteors play and vanish into wind or in a blaze decay the trojans and sicilians wildly stare and trembling turn their wonder into prayer the dardan prince put on a smiling face and strained acestes with a close embrace then honouring him with gifts above the rest turned the bad omen nor his fears confessed the gods said he this miracle have wrought and ordered you the prize without the lot accept this goblet rough with figured gold which thracian Caseus gave my sire of old this pledge of ancient amity receive which to my second sire i justly give he said and with the trumpet's cheerful sound proclaimed him victor and with laurel crowned nor good eurytion envied him the prize though he transfixed the pigeon in the skies who cut the line with second gifts was graced the third was his whose arrow pierced the mast the chief before the games were wholly done called periphantes tutor to his son and whispered thus with speed ascanius find and if his childish troop be ready joined on horseback let him grace his grandsire's day 
and lead his equals armed in just array he said and calling out the cirque he clears the crowd withdrawn an open plain appears and now the noble youths of form divine advance before their fathers in a line the riders grace the steeds the steeds with glory shine thus marching on in military pride shouts of applause resound from side to side their casques adorned with laurel wreaths they wear each brandishing aloft a cornel spear some at their backs their gilded quivers bore their chains of burnished gold hung down before three graceful troops they formed upon the green three graceful leaders at their head were seen twelve followed every chief and left a space between the first young priam led a lovely boy whose grandsire was the unhappy king of troy his race in after times was known to fame new honours adding to the latian name and well the royal boy his thracian steed became white were the fetlocks of his feet before and on his front a snowy star he bore then beauteous Atis with eulus bred of equal age the second squadron led the last in order but the first in place first in the lovely features of his face rode fair ascanius on a fiery steed queen dido's gift and of the tyrian breed sure coursers for the rest the king ordains with golden bits adorned and purple reins the pleased spectators peals of shouts renew and all the parents in the children view their make their motions and their sprightly grace and hopes and fears alternate in their face the unfledged commanders in their martial train first make the circuit of the sandy plain around their sires and at the appointed sign drawn up in beauteous order form a line the second signal sounds the troop divides in three distinguished parts with three distinguished guides again they close and once again disjoin in troop to troop opposed and line to line they meet they wheel they throw their darts afar with harmless rage and well dissembled war then and around the mingled bodies run flying they follow and pursuing shun broken they break and rallying they renew in other forms the military show at last in order undiscerned they join and march together in a friendly line and as the cretan labyrinth of old with wandering ways and many a winding fold involved the weary feet without redress in a round error which denied recess so fought the trojan boys in warlike play turned and returned and still a different way thus dolphins in the deep each other chase in circles when they swim around the watery race this game these carousels ascanius taught and building alba to the latins brought showed what he learned the latin sires impart to their succeeding sons the graceful art from these imperial rome received the game which troy the youths the trojan troop they name thus far the sacred sports they celebrate but fortune soon resumed her ancient hate for while they pay the dead his annual dues those envied rites saturnian juno views and sends the goddess of the various bow to try new methods of revenge below supplies the winds to wing her airy way wherein the port secure the navy lay swiftly fair iris down her arch descends and undiscerned her fatal voyage ends she saw the gathering crowd and gliding thence the desert shore and fleet without defence the trojan matrons on the sands alone with sighs and tears and Caeses' death bemoan then turning to the sea their weeping eyes their pity to themselves renews their cries alas said one what oceans yet remain for us to sail what labours to sustain all take the word and with a general groan implore the gods for peace and places of their own the goddess great in mischief views their pains and in a woman's form her heavenly limbs restrains in face and shape old beroe she became doriclus wife a venerable dame once blessed with riches and a mother's name thus changed amidst the crying crowd she ran mixed with the matrons and these words began 
o wretched we whom not the grecian power nor flames destroyed in troy's unhappy hour o wretched we reserved by cruel fate beyond the ruins of the sinking state now seven revolving years are wholly run since this improsperous voyage we begun since tossed from shores to shores from lands to lands inhospitable rocks and barren sands wandering in exile through the stormy sea we search in vain for flying italy now cast by fortune on this kindred land what should our rest and rising walls withstand or hinder here to fix our banished band o country lost and gods redeemed in vain if still in endless exile we remain shall we no more the trojan walls renew or streams of some dissembled simois view haste join with me the unhappy fleet consume cassandra bids and i declare her doom in sleep i saw her she supplied my hands for this i more than dreamt with flaming brands with these said she these wandering ships destroy these are your fatal seats and this your troy time calls you now the precious hour employ slack not the good presage while heaven inspires our minds to dare and gives the ready fires see neptune's altars minister their brands the god is pleased the god supplies our hands then from the pile a flaming fire she drew and tossed in air amidst the galleys threw wrapped in amaze the matrons wildly stare then pyrgo reverenced for her hoary hair pyrgo the nurse of priam's numerous race no beroe this though she belies her face what terrors from her frowning front arise behold a goddess in her ardent eyes what rays around her heavenly face are seen mark her majestic voice and more than mortal mien beroe but now i left whom pined with pain her age and anguish from these rites detain she said the matrons seized with new amaze roll their malignant eyes and on the navy gaze they fear and hope and neither part obey they hope the fated land but fear the fatal way the goddess having done her task below mounts up on equal wings and bends her painted bow struck with the sight and seized with rage divine the matrons prosecute their mad design they shriek aloud they snatch with impious hands the food of altars fires and flaming brands green boughs and saplings mingled in their haste and smoking torches on the ships they cast the flame unstopped at first more fury gains and vulcan rides at large with loosened reins triumphant to the painted sterns he soars and seizes in this way the banks and crackling oars eumelus was the first the news to bear while yet they crowd the rural theatre then what they hear is witnessed by their eyes a storm of sparkles and of flames arise ascanius took the alarm while yet he led his early warriors on his prancing steed and spurring on his equals soon o'erpassed nor could his frighted friends reclaim his haste soon as the royal youth appeared in view he sent his voice before him as he flew what madness moves you matrons to destroy the last remainders of unhappy troy not hostile fleets but your own hopes you burn and on your friends your fatal fury turn behold your own ascanius while he said he drew his glittering helmet from his head in which the youths to sportful arms he led by this aeneas and his train appear and now the women seized with shame and fear dispersed to woods and caverns take their flight abhor their actions and avoid the light their friends acknowledge and their error find and shake the goddess from their altered mind not so the raging fires their fury cease but lurking in the seams with seeming peace work on their way amid the smouldering tow sure in destruction but in motion slow the silent plague through the green timber eats and vomits out a tardy flame by fits down to the keels and upward to the sails the fire descends or mounts but still prevails nor buckets poured nor strength of human hand 
can the victorious element withstand the pious hero rends his robe and throws to heaven his hands and with his hands his vows o jove he cried if prayers can yet have place if thou abhorst not all the darden race if any spark of pity still remain if gods are gods and not invoked in vain yet spare the relics of the trojan train yet from the flames are burning vessels free or let thy fury fall alone on me at this devoted head thy thunder throw and send the willing sacrifice below scarce had he said when southern storms arise from pole to pole the forky lightning flies loud rattling shakes the mountains and the plain heaven bellies downward and descends in rain whole sheets of water from the clouds are sent which hissing through the planks the flames prevent and stop the fiery pest four ships alone burn to the waste and for the fleet atone but doubtful thoughts the hero's heart divide if he should still in sicily reside forgetful of his fates or tempt the main in hope the promised italy to gain the nautes old and wise to whom alone the will of heaven by pallas was foreshown versed in portents experienced and inspired to tell events and what the fates required thus while he stood to neither part inclined with cheerful words relieved his labouring mind o goddess born resigned in every state with patience bear with prudence push your fate by suffering well our fortune we subdue fly when she frowns and when she calls pursue your friend acestes is of trojan kind to him disclose the secrets of your mind trust in his hands your old and useless train too numerous for the ships which yet remain the feeble old indulgent of their ease the dames who dread the dangers of the seas with all the dastard crew who dare not stand the shock of battle with your foes by land here you may build a common town for all and from acestes name acesta call the reasons with his friends experience joined encouraged much but more disturbed his mind twas dead of night when to his slumbering eyes his father's shade descended from the skies and thus he spoke o oh, more than vital breath loved while i lived and dear even after death o oh, son in various toils and troubles tossed the king of heaven employs my careful ghost on his commands the god who saved from fire your flaming fleet and heard your just desire the wholesome counsel of your friend receive and here the coward train and woman leave the chosen youth and those who nobly dare transport to tempt the dangers of the war the stern italians will their courage try rough are their manners and their minds are high but first to pluto's palace you shall go and seek my shade among the blest below for not with impious ghosts my soul remains nor suffers with the damned perpetual pains but breathes the living air of soft elysian plains the chaste sibylla shall your steps convey and blood of offered victims free the way there shall you know what realms the gods assign and learn the fates and fortunes of your line but now farewell i vanish with the night and feel the blast of heaven's approaching light he said and mixed with shades he took his airy flight whither so fast the filial duty cried and why ah oh, why the wish to embrace denied he said and rose as holy zeal inspires he rakes hot embers and renews the fires his country gods and vesta then adores with cakes and incense and their aid implores next for his friends and royal host he sent revealed his vision and the gods intent with his own purpose all without delay the will of jove and his desires obey they list with women each degenerate name who dares not hazard life for future fame these they cashier the brave remaining few oars banks and cables half consumed renew the prince designs a city with the plough the lots their several tenements allow this part is named from ilium that from troy and the new king ascends the throne with joy 
a chosen senate from the people draws appoints the judges and ordains the laws then on the top of eryx they begin a rising temple to the paphian queen anchises last is honored as a god a priest is added annual gifts bestowed and groves are planted round his blessed abode nine days they pass in feasts their temples crowned and fumes of incense in the fanes abound then from the south arose a gentle breeze that curled the smoothness of the glassy seas the rising winds a ruffling gale afford and call the merry mariners aboard now loud laments along the shores resound of parting friends in close embraces bound the trembling women the degenerate train who shunned the frightful dangers of the main even those desire to sail and take their share of the rough passage and the promised war whom good aeneas cheers and recommends to their new master's care his fearful friends on eric's altars three fat calves he lays a lamb new fallen to the stormy seas then slips his halsers and his anchors weighs high on the deck the godlike hero stands with olive crowned a charger in his hands then cast the reeking entrails in the brine and poured the sacrifice of purple wine fresh gales arise with equal strokes they vie and brush the buxom seas and o'er the billows fly meantime the mother goddess full of fears to neptune thus addressed with tender tears the pride of jove's imperious queen the rage the malice which no sufferings can assuage compel me to these prayers since neither fate nor time nor pity can remove her hate even jove is thwarted by his haughty wife still vanquished yet she still renews the strife as if twere little to consume the town which awed the world and wore the imperial crown she prosecutes the ghost of troy with pains and gnaws even to the bones the last remains let her the causes of her hatred tell but you can witness its effects too well you saw the storm she raised on libyan floods that mixed the mounting billows with the clouds when bribing aeolus she shook the main and moved rebellion in your watery reign with fury she possessed the dardan dames to burn their fleet with execrable flames and forced aeneas when his ships were lost to leave his followers on a foreign coast for what remains your godhead i implore and trust my son to your protecting power if neither jove's nor fate's decree withstand secure his passage to the latian land then thus the mighty ruler of the main what may not venus hope from neptune's reign my kingdom claims your birth my late defence of your endangered fleet may claim your confidence nor less by land than sea my deeds declare how much your loved aeneas is my care thee xanthus and thee simois i attest your trojan troops when proud achilles pressed and drove before him headlong on the plain and dashed against the walls the trembling train when floods were filled with bodies of the slain when crimson xanthus doubtful of his way stood up on ridges to behold the sea new heaps came tumbling in and choked his way when your aeneas fought but fought with odds of force unequal and unequal gods i spread a cloud before the victor's sight sustained the vanquished and secured his flight even then secured him when i sought with joy the vowed destruction of ungrateful troy my will's the same fair goddess fear no more your fleet shall safely gain the latian shore their lives are given one destined head alone shall perish and for multitudes atone thus having armed with hopes her anxious mind his finny team saturnian neptune joined then adds the foamy bridle to their jaws and to the loosened reins permits the laws high on the waves as as your car he guides its axles thunder and the sea subsides and the smooth ocean rolls her silent tides the tempests fly before their father's face trains of inferior gods his triumph grace 
and monster whales before their master play, and choirs of tritons crowd the watery way. The marshalled powers in equal troops divide to right and left, the gods his better side enclose, and on the worse the nymphs and nereids ride. Now smiling hope, with sweet vicissitude within the hero's mind, his joys renewed. He calls to raise the masts, the sheets display, the cheerful crew with diligence obey. They scud before the wind and sail in open sea. Ahead of all the master pilot steers, and as he leads the following navy veers. The steeds of night had travelled half the sky, the drowsy rowers on their benches lie. When the soft god of sleep with easy flight descends and draws behind a trail of light, thou, Palinurus, art his destined prey, to thee alone he takes his fatal way. Dire dreams to thee and iron sleep he bears, and, lighting on thy prow, the form of Forbus wears. Then thus the traitor god began his tale. The winds, my friend, inspire a pleasing gale. The ships without thy care securely sail. Now steal an hour of sweet repose, and I will take the rudder and thy room supply. To whom the yawning pilot half asleep, me dost thou bid to trust the treacherous deep, the harlot smiles of her dissembling face, and to her faith commit the Trojan race? Shall I believe the siren south again, and oft betrayed not know the monster main? He said, his fastened hands the rudder keep, and fixed on heaven his eyes repel invading sleep. The god was wroth and at his temples threw a branch in leaf dipped and drunk with stygian dew the pilot vanquished by the power divine soon closed his swimming eyes and lay supine scarce were his limbs extended at their length the god insulting with superior strength fell heavy on him plunged him in the sea and with the stern the rudder tore away headlong he fell and struggling in the main cried out for helping hands but cried in vain. The victor daimon mounts obscure in air, while the ship sails without the pilot's care. On Neptune's faith the floating fleet relies, but what the man forsook the god supplies, and o'er the dangerous deep secure the navy flies. Glides by the siren's cliffs a shelfy coast, long infamous for ships and sailors lost, and white with bones. The impetuous ocean roars, and rocks rebellow from the sounding shores. The watchful hero felt the knocks, and found the tossing vessel sailed on shoaly ground. Sure of his pilot's loss, he takes himself the helm, and steers aloof, and shuns the shelf. Inly he grieved, and, groaning from the breast, deplored his death, and thus his pain expressed. For faith reposed on seas and on the flattering sky, thy naked corpse is doomed on shores unknown to lie. End of section 10